Today on Pilot's Discretion, we're joined by mechanic and pilot Chelsea Smith. She talks about maintaining radial engines, flying her Cessna solo across the U.S., and how to do a better pre-flight inspection. Pilot's Discretion starts right now. Hi, Pilots. I'm John Zimmerman of Sporties, and today I'm excited to have Chelsea Smith on the podcast. You may know her better as High Maintenance Chels on Instagram, where she shares her adventures as both a pilot and a mechanic. And I can tell you, if you're sick of the same old thing in your Instagram feed, I highly recommend following her for both great flying photos and practical maintenance tips. When she's not turning wrenches, she's often flying around the country with Josh Flowers of Aviation 101 on YouTube. Chelsea, welcome to Pilot's Discretion. Hi, how are you? Thanks for having me today. I'm excited. Lots to talk about from lots of different parts of aviation, but let's start with maintenance, which is a subject you obviously know something about. So as a pilot and a mechanic, I'm interested in your perspective on particularly the pre-flight inspection. What is something you're looking at or thinking about as both a pilot and a mechanic that most of us regular pilots don't think about? Yeah, that's a great question. So what kind of sparked my um, reflection on this as a pilot was looking at a picture of myself from when I was 17, beginning my first few flight lessons. And then I was in the photo, I was doing a pre-flight and looking at back at that photo now as a mechanic, I was trying to put myself back in those shoes and think about, you know, how has my pre-flight changed and what am I looking for in greater detail now? And also I was trying to figure out what exactly I was even looking at as a brand new baby pilot. You know, I I was just relying on the little experience I had combined with the, the experience that my CFI in the flight school had. So, um, you know, things have changed for me a lot, gaining experience as a mechanic and pre-flight has been one of them. So, you know, the way I approach a plane even is different now. And for example, one of the things as soon as I'm walking up to the plane from afar is when I start my pre-flight. So I'm looking on the ground for puddles. I'm looking for any oil marks or streaks. I'm looking for smoking rivets. Um, anything that might not look like it has the right type of travel or play, like for example, control surfaces. Um, I'm just looking for the dirt and the grime to tell me a story, everything from that to the bigger stuff. So, um, one of the things that I also like to consider is if a plane has just come out of maintenance. And I'm, I'm trying to think about, you know, what all did they have disassembled? What have they pulled off the plane for this previous maintenance thing or task that they were dealing with a discrepancy? And, you know, are those components where they put back correctly? Is everything um, torque sealed or safety wired? You know, things can be missed. And so I, I try to approach a plane with a maintenance mentality before I even get in it. and um, just trying to think about, you know, the redundant stuff. And so if something fails, what is my backup or what is my plan um, when I'm in the air if those if those things start to happen? Yeah, you had an interesting post recently about post-maintenance flights or post-annual flights, which historically carry some extra risk. So for a pilot maybe who isn't intimately involved with the maintenance on their airplane, Is there a a tip you have for a pilot who's going out to fly after major maintenance or is, should there be some type of handoff discussion with a mechanic or what would you like to see as a mechanic for a pilot going out on that first flight? So I'm, I'm walking up to the plane and I I have my maintenance thinking cap on before I even get in the flight, get into the plane to do the flight. And I'm just going, even grabbing the surfaces. Let's say the cowling was off. I run my hand over all of, I don't know if that you have dust fittings or screws, or there's many different types of cowl fasteners. I am actually touching all of those cowl fasteners, grabbing the front of the cowling, giving it a wiggle, making sure that everything feels secure. Um, the spinner on the prop, I am going to check, you know, the connection points on ailerons and stuff like that. If it's been any type of control surface maintenance. And then I am doing a very, thorough and hefty run up um, and double checking everything to a further extent. And then I will not do a post maintenance flight 
if it is not day VFR conditions, I won't do it with passengers unless it's another mechanic or somebody who needs to go up to see stuff for the purpose of that flight um, for recording or for analytics or something like that. I always encourage people post maintenance, go and lap around the pattern, shake it out, um, make sure that you're not taking people on some scenic flight over the Grand Canyon um, and that you're constantly thinking, you know, what's my way out on this? What was worked on? So what's most likely to fail? What am I looking for? What are the characteristics for troubleshooting those once I get off the ground? And what's my backup plan? Um, and then I, I try to make sure that, you know, all of my post maintenance flights are extremely thorough. I'm I keep altitude as my friend and um, I just stay really focused on that stuff. Yeah, that's great advice. Do you think in general pilots should be more involved in the maintenance of the aircraft, whether it's actually turning wrenches, doing oil changes, or just communicating and, and watching the mechanic? What's your view on that? Or, or does that get in your way and distract you as a mechanic? You know, um, kind of a little bit of both. So I know some maintenance shops, just for insurance purposes, they don't really have anyone besides the mechanics on the floor. But one of the things that I always encourage plane owners to do, or if you're at a flight school, asking if you can go and just watch or assist the mechanic on even just an oil change to give yourself the opportunity to have that cowling off, to go through, do parts identification, kind of put almost a face to a name for a component to where when you're on the other side of that firewall and you're flying along and you start getting an enunciator or some type of warning light or anything is going on, you have a much more thorough um, understanding of your system and you're thinking about that stuff a lot differently. I know for myself, um, whenever I started pulling cowlings off of planes or running through the hydraulic systems while doing maintenance and stuff like that, I started looking at my plane almost without the skin on it when I was flying, thinking about, okay, if something fails, where is it probably going to go wrong? And what system can I rely on at that point? So I encourage airplane owners, especially airplane owners, to try to see if you can just assist on a couple oil changes and then start using your private pilot's license to its full capability and start tackling that preventative maintenance on your own. Um, part 43, preventative maintenance. If you're flying your own aircraft under part 91, so that's not charter, that's not 121 airline, none of that. If you're flying your aircraft under part 91, you're allowed to follow the preventative maintenance section in part 43 and do, I think it's like 33, maybe 32 items, some apply to helicopters, some, some apply to balloons. But there are a lot of things on there that once you start getting familiar and comfortable with those things, you can start doing. And I think it just gives you um, a better relationship with your aircraft. Um, you start to see things a lot differently when you start doing your own maintenance. I think you start to care um, and you're a little bit easier on the controls when you can see how many components are working for you in the sky, you see the tight tolerances and start understanding how those all work to a different capacity and a different level. And so, like I said, I just, I always start encouraging people to start out with an oil change and see where it takes you. And maybe you'll fall in love with maintenance like I did and spend a few years doing an apprenticeship or a part 147 program. Um, you, you never know what those things will turn into, but one thing it will for sure turn into is a better understanding of, of the ship that you're trusting your life and your passengers' lives in and, um, you know, broadening the horizon of your knowledge. You mentioned your journey there in, in maintenance, which I think is fascinating. I didn't realize when you started out, you know, you were not somebody who was just determined to be a mechanic from the age of 10 or anything. So, I find that somewhat encouraging for people who assume that maybe they don't know enough about maintenance, but tell us your story and kind of your encouragement for somebody who's interested in maintenance, but maybe doesn't think they can do it. So when it comes to maintenance, you know, I grew up, my dad is incredibly, um, 
incredibly mechanically inclined. And my uncle, which is the one who, the person who got me into aviation, he was building an aircraft and it's still not complete. He's still in the process of building. It is a Fokker DR1 triplane. It's a full scale replica from Prince. And I wasn't really involved with that, but I was around it growing up. And so seeing those things gave me the confidence to sign up for a maintenance program. Um, I started out flying and knew I wanted to be really involved. And then I started looking at college programs and trying to figure out, you know, what my next move was. And aviation maintenance was something that I had never considered before. Um, but because I had people in my life who were involved with maintenance, I saw my dad working on cars and tractors and bulldozers and everything around our house growing up, you know, I wasn't intimidated by picking up a wrench and, and having the confidence that, you know, these things got to be fixed by someone. So why not me? Um, but when I started out in AMP school, I truly didn't even know the names of all of my tools. And so I went from that and I, I was cranking through a two and a half year program and I ended up graduating and falling in love with a realm and finding myself in an arena of aviation that I never thought I would be in. Um, but I love it just as much as flying. I find it incredibly challenging and also incredibly rewarding when you can take something totally apart understand it and then start the reassembly process and you're mastering that mechanical aspect of an aircraft. And, you know, I think it, for me, it was, it was very intimidating to look at an airplane and think that I was responsible as a mechanic for making sure all of those components, you know, were operating properly. But once you start taking everything and breaking it down to an individual system and then even further to components of the system. And you learn everything in kind of that set curriculum process of one by one. Aviation maintenance is not that. Um, I mean, it's a lot to understand, but individual components are, are not too terribly complex um, until you start putting them together and adding intolerances and stuff. But I, I always tell people, you know, I didn't know anything about maintenance before I started, and it took me into completing two internships, four advanced training programs, and now I could not imagine my life in aviation without the influence of maintenance, and I think it, it just gave me an extra, you know, sense of security when it comes to flying. I look at that a lot differently now. And I just, I navigate everything differently. And I, I think most of my opportunities personally have come from being a mechanic in aviation. What's your advice for a young woman who's considering that career? Because I think when most people think aviation mechanic, you think, you know, old white guy. Uh, and so for you as a younger person, as a woman coming in that industry, what's your perspective there? What's your advice? Historically, it is a male dominated industry. Currently only 2% of the people in aviation maintenance are women. I had been in aviation maintenance school for a year and a half before I met another female mechanic. And at first when I started out in aviation maintenance school, I didn't want to get any kind of attention for being a girl. I just wanted to fit in. I wanted to have a really good relationship with all of the guys in my class, and I didn't want to be any different than them. I just wanted to become a good mechanic, and I was kind of shying away from the fact that it was very rare to be a, a female mechanic, and I shied away from that until I met another female mechanic, and I remember how impactful that moment was for me. And after that, I started getting involved with organizations like AWAM, Association for Women in Aviation Maintenance, and a, and a few more. Um, and I, I see on a lot of organizations that have Facebook pages, sometimes it can be very negative and hateful towards the men in the industry. And so, um, you know, I, whenever I reflect on that, I think about how you'll, you'll find that negativity in any industry. You'll find off the wall comments from men and women aren't always innocent when it comes to that stuff either. 
Um, but personally, my experience in aviation hasn't been um, slam doors in my face. I think that being a female mechanic, I am, I stand out a lot, but also I have to work twice as hard to kind of prove my worth, which can be hard, but I see that as a challenge and I welcome it. And all of the, the guys that I'm out bending wrenches with in the shop, they do not treat me any different. And so that's kind of something that I've been very grateful for an experience that has been that smooth for me so far. And uh, so I always encourage women, you know, go after that, even if you're the only girl in the class or you're going to be the only girl in the shop. And, you know, you can, you can find negativity anywhere in any industry. Chelsea, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with some more questions. Take your flying skills to the next level with Sporty's Tailwheel Checkout Course. Over two hours of 4K video help you master these demanding airplanes and explore a huge variety of tailwheel operations, from Piper Cubs on grass strips to turbine otters on glaciers. You'll fly with legendary pilot and flight instructor Patty Wagstaff as she demonstrates everything from tailwheel basics to advanced bush flying techniques. Visit sporties.com slash tailwheel for a free demo. Now, back to pilot's discretion. We're back with Chelsea Smith, and I want to move to the pilot side of the equation. We've been talking about maintenance, but you're also an accomplished pilot. And I know recently you flew a really great flight. At least to me, it sounds like fun. 1,700 miles from Kentucky to Arizona by yourself in your Cessna 150. What is the value of doing a trip like that solo? Whenever you do a trip that far solo, I think it it is just kind of everything logistically falls on you. It's you're doing all of the communications, all of the navigation, you're, you know, making your go no go decisions, everything falls on your shoulders. So for me to fly across the country solo that far in the 150 when I made it here and I got on the ground, I felt like it was a huge personal accomplishment. Um, and then I also just felt like it was the biggest privilege as an aviator. I felt like I had the best seat to all of the train and everything between Kentucky and Arizona across the country from just a few thousand feet. And I spent that time reflecting on my journey as an aviator, which has been a roller coaster. I know a lot of people feel the same. Um, I know with social media, it can make everything look sugar-coated and easy, um, but I know that that is usually not the case for a lot of people, and it hasn't been the case for me. I've loved every second of it, and I loved every second of that flight, um, and like I said, when I got on the ground, I was, I was talking to my mentor, which is the reason I'm out here, um, but when I, when I got on the ground here, I was like, you know, I flew out here solo, and that was wonderful, but I definitely did not get here alone. I have an incredible support system when it comes to my mentors, the teachers, all of my flight instructors, my incredible family. Without every single one of them in my equation, I wouldn't be where I am today in aviation, within my career, within maintenance, flying, any of it. And so, yes, it was a solo flight and it was incredibly challenging um, making some of the go, no go go and no go decisions. And, and I think we're going to talk about that more in this podcast. Um, a pretty challenging one that I had to make, but um, it was wonderful. It was, I think, 23 hours. I had several fuel stops. Um, I first flew to Texas and uh, met up with Josh Flowers, and he actually came out here with me. So my route was a little bit longer. I took the Southern route, which is what I wanted to do. Of course, the 150 is not going to be um, making good clearance <laughs> over the 14ers in Colorado. So I, I chose the Southern route, which kind of followed I-10 through El Paso and, and then up to Kingman, Arizona. So um, it was beautiful watching the train go from green to the more desert uh, style and then all of the mountains and valleys and peaks and gorges. I mean, I, I really felt like it was a very special and pivotal, pivotal moment within my, my journey as an aviator. 
Let's talk about the challenges. You alluded it, alluded to it there, but uh, as I understand it, you had a, an interesting experience with the refueling stop. I did, yeah. So it was actually my first um, in-flight emergency. I, I do consider it an in-flight emergency. I handled it as one. Um, so I had just left Kentucky. I made my first fuel stop. Everything was good to go. Um, and then I, I stopped at my second airport. Everything was normal. Fueled up. Uh, grabbed another coffee and I started something my tanks and at first I'm watching the fuel fill up in the cup I have one of the bigger strainers I, I don't prefer the strainer the fuel sumps that are small I don't think that it gives you a good enough view of it I like that some of them have a screwdriver on the end of it but um, I have the bigger cup that I use for something and when I first started something, I just was really confused because the only thing coming out was clear. And I was like, is this jet a like, did I fuel with the wrong thing or something? Uh, which is hard to do because the nozzles are different sizes, but anyways, so, and then all of a sudden it started coming out blue, the Avgas 100 low lead. And I ended up something over four things out of my plane, four containers full of water. Wow. I had a ton of fuel contamination. I ended up um, posting some stuff about it, about it on my Instagram. I have never seen any fuel contamination so bad. Um, it was a tiny little airport between Kentucky and Texas. And um, so I sumped, dumped, sump, dumped, rocked my wings, did the whole thing again. I dipped my tail I tried to shift the airplane to where I was making sure that I didn't have one wing higher than the other. I pulled, I pulled water out of both wings. Um, my Cessna 150 actually has four locations to pull fuel. So one on each wing, the gas escalator, and then I have a lowest point sump underneath the cowling. Um, and so I was, I was pulling fuel from everywhere until I felt like I was very certain that I, I had no more water. I even took a lap around the airport waiting for things to settle. Um, even though the fuel weight water weight ratio is, is pretty significant. So they separate pretty quickly, but just to be sure I, I lapped around the airport, some hangers, and then came back sumped again. And, and I felt really good about it. So I took off, um, keeping that in the back of my mind the whole time. I, I did an extensive run up and everything, everything felt good. Um, and I even left a note before I, I climbed back in the plane at the fuel sump and I stuck it, I taped it on there and said, please sump, just pulled, I think I put like a half gallon of water out of my plane. I don't know if it was actually a half gallon, but I just wanted to make sure the other aviators weren't, you know, in a rush or in a hurry and neglecting that, that critical step in their pre-flight after fueling. So I left a note and climbed in and took off and everything was uneventful, landed at my next airport for fuel. And I was something and got a bunch of water again, not nearly as much as the first time, but probably five or six tablespoons, um, which was kind of startling because I felt very confident that I had gotten it all out. And I was you know, I can't say, of course, for certain if it didn't come from the second airport, but after pulling that much from the first airport where I had water contamination, I was, I was pretty certain that it had gotten left in the tank somehow. So I took off again um, after doing the same sump and dump process, and no water was coming out anymore. Everything felt good to go. Um, my run-up was good. I Gained a bunch of altitude on that next leg. I went higher than I normally go. And I was cruising along, picked up flight following. I was talking to center. And then all of a sudden, you know, it went from me gazing out the window to me immediately pulling carb, checking all my fuel, my fuel valve, um, and looking at my gauges because my engine started to bog down and come back and bog down and come back. And immediately what popped into my head was fuel contamination. But I went ahead and ran that um, emergency engine failure type checklist that I practice constantly. You know, I, I took 
um, some advice from my DPE who gave me my private pilot's license, Colonel Bill Peters out of Charleston, West Virginia. And he said, you know, you're done with your private pilot, but please, as an aviator, spend time every, you know, few months, go out and pick another maneuver that was on that private pilot syllabus and just practice it. And that was something that I really took to heart. And I think it's, it's really helped me um, in a lot of situations um, in keeping my, you know, slow flight practice up and going out and still doing stalls and stuff like that and the emergency um, procedure checklist. So I ran that and I went ahead and squawked 7,700, which definitely was something that, you know, as an aviator, we always hope that we never get into that situation, but always prepare in case we do. So I squawked 7,700. I had fields picked out below me and I contacted center that I was talking to during that moment. And I said, um, Cessna 150, this is exactly where I'm located. I think it was 12 nautical miles north of an airport. And I was having what I thought was fuel, con fuel contamination and that my engine was starting to run rough um but it had stabilized and he just said okay sounds good are you declaring an emergency and i said not at the moment but i wanted to go ahead and get that on radar and go ahead and have you guys looking out for me while i'm looking out for my next landing location so i continued on the engine um really smoothed out after that and i landed at an airport told them you know i'm I'm within gliding distance. I did not descend at all until I was 100% so close to the airport that I had to do a couple circles to get down um, and lose that altitude. Anytime anything like that is going on, I always try to, you know, altitude your friend and stay high. And I did. And then I got on the ground. And that was when my, you know, like we said, doing a long cross country and you're the only pilot, or maybe you have another pilot with you, um, those decisions are, are hard to make and can be hard by yourself when it, you don't really have a bunch of um, experienced aviators around you to tell you what their opinion of the situation is and how they would, you know, maybe address it. But I re the fuel tanks. And at that moment, when I got done, I had no water come out and I had two hours until dark and I had two hours left to fly. And there was no way that with any situation like that, I would take off at night having just had that issue, even though I was really certain that it was fuel contamination, that's just not a risk and a margin that I'm willing to dance with. So I knew that I had two hours and I was like, well, I don't want to feel pressured. I can grab, always grab a hotel and dive into some maintenance stuff tomorrow but I am pretty sure that was just it, digesting the last little bit of water. I'm going to get in the plane, do a hefty run up, circle the airport until I get a few thousand feet. And I feel very confident that that issue is, has gone away and continue on. And that's what I did. I did not find any more water or have any more issues until I landed at San Marcos. Um, and then the next day I, I sumped my, tank several more times before I took off to continue the trek out to Kingman and I haven't had any issues since so it was just some fuel contamination um, I felt like I handled it well and like I said I was just very thankful that I took Colonel Bill Peters advice in practicing those things far beyond the check ride and I will continue to do so and challenge all other aviators to do that as well. Yeah, that's a great reminder that a lot of those maneuvers are not just for the check ride. There's a practical reason we learn them. All right, Chelsea, at the end of all these podcast episodes, we like to do a ready to copy segment where I ask some quick questions and you give me your quick answer. So are you ready to copy? I am ready to copy. Which was more challenging, earning your A&P or your pilot certificate? For me, it was the A&P. I did a two and a half year program. Uh, it was a part 147 curriculum through a college in Kentucky. And I felt like the amount of information and everything that was covered was a lot more challenging than the private pilot. 
But I don't think it's fair to compare the private pilot to the AMP license. What I compare the AMP license to is the ATP rating, which I do not have yet. Um, so it's, it's really hard to tell. The way that I like to explain it to people is, you know, the liability difference when it comes to aviation maintenance versus flying. And the liability is, is huge. You're dealing with lives on both sides. But I will say that for me personally, it is more stressful on the maintenance side than the flying side. And my example of that is when I get done doing maintenance, and I'm at home and I'm trying to fall asleep and I, my eyes will flash open and I'm like, did I put a cotter key in that? Am I for sure about that? And there's never a time when I will ever sign off a plane that I do, would not put my family in in that moment. Um, and that's just a standard that I hope all AMPs hold themselves to. But when I get done flying and I button up the plane and everything's chalked and tied down or in the hangar and closed away and I leave, my, my brain is released from that moment. So personally, I think that the maintenance side can be a lot more information, a lot more what if. The regs, you know, in part 43, I think that there are only 13 rules that strictly define and govern aviation uh, maintenance and how mechanics perform stuff. And I think that there are hundreds of rules just for the private pilot's license. So a lot of it just comes from experience and learning how to troubleshoot. So for me, the answer is aviation maintenance was a lot harder, but we'll see down the road. Right now you're working in a shop that maintains some very interesting engines, the Russian M14P. So what's the strangest thing about that engine for a American pilot who's used to Lycoming or Continental? Yeah, so one of the really unique things on the M14 engine that we deal with is the pneumatic system. So that engine has an air start, it has air brakes, um, and all of the stuff is not, it does not have any uh, hydraulic stuff on that engine. It doesn't have an electric start. So, you know, we're lapping compressors that build that air for us. It, it works like an alternator, basically, that's charging a battery, except it's a mini air compressor and it's charging up what we jokingly call a scuba tank and that's basically our battery and so within that system we have metal to metal there's no gaskets it's just metal to metal contact that we have to precisely lap and check and use those metal to metal contacts to build air and as we know water molecules are a lot larger than air molecules air molecules have a lot of give. There's a lot of sponge in it. That's why we bleed brakes is to get rid of the air. Um, but making metal to metal contact surfaces airtight is incredibly challenging. Um, but we love the air start system that you find on the M14 engines, but it's one of the biggest differences when it comes to um, that engine versus a lot of the other radials. Social media question for you, where your uh, Instagram page to me is a uh, a lot of useful, interesting information. What's your one tip for a young person in pursuing an aviation career? How can you use social media as a positive force? Social media in general in every industry has really taken off. I think it's given people a lot of inspiration. Uh, I know it has for me. It's given me a, an opportunity to connect with people all over the country and all over the world who use social media. Um, but I also think, and personally, I take it as a big responsibility to kind of judge what I'm posting and figuring out, you know, is it true? Is it super accurate? Is it safe? I don't want to post something where I'm out doing some kind of crazy uh, flight maneuvers or give bad context on some maintenance to where people think that what I'm doing is acceptable if it's not. Um, I really get upset when I see pilots out doing flight maneuvers and stuff that are, do not have a backstory and they're using it to show off. And that young pilot that looks up to you, that's followed you for a long time or an experienced pilot might not know how much went into that. And if you're promoting this unsafe line or unsafe maintenance practices. And that's kind of the 
mentality that you carry and it bleeds into your social media posts, I think it can. I just personally, I see it as a big responsibility to promote safe practices like Josh always says and um, use it to stay safe and connect with people. All right. We always like to go beyond just aviation on this podcast. So two non-aviation questions, or at least not exactly aviation as we wrap up. I know you used to shoot competitively. Are there any lessons you learned from that world that apply to flying or maintaining airplanes? Absolutely. Um, I grew up shooting my entire life. Um, and I shot competitively in high school. And it was the one the one lesson that I took away that I can apply to other so many other aspects within my life is learning how to focus and have that laser concentration, which I had never known before I started shooting competitively. I, I didn't master mental control of blocking everything else out, leaving the problems out the door, not being distracted. And, you know, some days I would come in and have a lot on my mind and that reflected in my scores. And then the days that I was able to just unplug and focus on the task at hand and keep my sights aim small, miss small, down the range, I was able to perform phenomenally. And it was very rewarding. And I I loved every second of that. And so that's what I took away from from shooting competitively. And I know that there are lots of other um, jobs and hobbies and stuff that you can get that can help you learn how to focus. But for me, it really pointed out that distracted side that we might not feel bleeding into other aspects of our life when we need to be concentrating. And so I, I took that with me into aviation and, you know, a lot of times if you do have too much on your plate or you're juggling a lot or you're distracted or you've had just a bad day, you know, cancel the flight and go again tomorrow, the plane will still be there. And, um, you know, learning how to focus and, and also learning when to identify that you're distracted and you probably shouldn't be operating an aircraft. One of my favorite foods is a Kentucky hot brown. For those of us in Ohio, it's a great reason to go to the great Commonwealth of Kentucky to find that. So you spent a lot of time in Kentucky. Where is the best place to get one? Where should I stop on my next flying trip to Kentucky? Your next flying trip to Kentucky should be to... Lexington, and you can go to this historically rich, it used to be a gas station, and now it's a sandwich place. They have a lawn, and it's located right in the center of so many very, very famous and successful horse farms. It's called Wallace Station. They have a ton of sandwiches. They're all made right there. Their hot brown is incredible. I've had it, and it is such a beautiful drive through the rich Kentucky bluegrass area in Kentucky. You pass Keeneland, you pass the castle, and the Lexington Airport is also a wonderful experience. There's lots of good places to eat, though, in Kentucky. So I I do hope that you make it to Wallace Station, but if you don't, I don't think you'll be disappointed. I appreciate the tip, and I would back up your recommendation. Kentucky, especially that part around Lexington, is criminally underrated for how beautiful it is to both fly over and drive through. So, All right, our last question every time on this podcast, Chelsea, you have one flight left, and we want to know, what are you flying, and where are you going? Gosh, that is that is an incredibly hard question, and I think that there are so many aircraft that I just dream of eventually maybe flying one day, so that makes it really difficult to choose, and then, you know, how would you not say that you want your last flight to be around the world? Maybe I'd have to pick a glider that one of the gliders that can go super far distances. So I wasn't limited by my fuel capacity. Um, But I, I think for me, I wouldn't choose a plane or a place, but I would choose people um, to fill that plane with for my last flight. I, I constantly am thanking my mentors and, and repaying them by passing it forward. And um, my last flight would, would have to be with, with family and friends um, rather than planes and places. That's a great answer. You're almost making me think about rephrasing that question, but we'll give you credit for that. Chelsea, thanks for being on the podcast. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. And I look forward to us maybe just doing some flying again soon. Absolutely. (laughs) 
Thanks for listening to Pilot's Discretion, brought to you by Sporty's Pilot Shop, training and equipping pilots worldwide for over 60 years. For more episodes and links to additional information, visit sporties.com slash podcast. And if you have comments or guest ideas, email podcast at sporties.com. I'm John Zimmerman. We'll see you next time on Pilot's Discretion.